All right. Baird, we just got done talking to uh, Randy Wooten from Maxio. My head's still spinning a little bit. What a, what a great discussion. We talked a lot about M&A, talked a lot about private equity funding, but they also released this report. What was it called? The uh, B2B growth B2B <laughs> growth report for SaaS. Really good insights yep. in there. Yeah, um, it was great. But- yeah, they do this. They do the report quarterly and uh, the Q1 report came out from this year. And uh, good news, a lot of positive signs in the private SaaS space in a lot of different sectors. We we talked about um, SaaS growth across a lot of different in- industries, a lot of different pricing models and uh, different size companies. So if you're running a, a SaaS company, you probably want to hear where you fall in their benchmark reporting. It was um, it was good and it was it was optimistic, especially compared to a lot of what we heard last year in the yeah. in the public sectors in SaaS. So um, I'm always up for a dose of optimism in our market don't you think it's funny that when we have a growth rate of 14 percent in SaaS, we call that a recession yeah because it's actually not a recession by the technical definition but it's all relative. people feel like we're in a tech recession right now mm-hmm. um but recession the definition of that is that you're actually going backwards right you're 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 shrinking not growing but yep. the industry is still growing which is good for yeah, us it was, yeah it was good optimistic and then uh, we got to hear about the maxio merger that happened a few years ago and Randy um, leading that merger uh, between those two different companies. And that sounds like quite the journey. So it's, uh, it, this will be a good listen. Awesome. All right. Y'all enjoy. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking some time to chat with us. Um, sure. My pleasure. We wanted to pick your brain. I mean, I, I think, you know, we, um, we, I think we serve different sides of, of maybe a similar marketplace. You yeah. all, um, you know, and maybe you can share a little bit more about Maxio and how it mm-hmm. came to get, you know, the companies that came together to form it and the types of customers that you work with, but sort of more the invoiced side of things. Um, mm-hmm. We, we service uh, heavily a, a PLG kind of, kind of company today. Right. Um, so anything with an online self-serve purchase process and, you know, we're, we deal with cancellations and involuntary churn. Right. right. Um, and so that's an important you know, part of the world for us. But I think there's a lot of overlap too in the kind of yeah. things that, that your customers care about, the kind of things that our customers care about. And one of the things we always do on this podcast, we like to do, is we like to learn because we're building a business. This is a, yeah. we're, we're a relatively early stage company. And mm-hmm. um, uh, so we, we might have some selfish questions for you along the way. Sure, too, happy cool to. With it. Yeah. So. Are we recording? <laughs> Already recording, man. All right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Takes all the pressure off when you just hit the record button, doesn't it? Okay. Well, but good. you well, share you shared something interesting with us. Yeah. You, I mean, I was actually looking at your state of B two B subscription growth report from yeah. January, and you were yeah. kind enough to send us um, the Q one completed Q one version of that or draft right. version of that. So um, I'm curious what what sticks out to you is is interesting in this report. Like, what's the what's the the, the blinking beacon in the, the Q1 state of B2B growth report. Sure. I'll be happy to answer that. Maybe just set a little bit of context about Maxio because yeah. then that helps sets the report. So yeah. Maxio, we're primarily focused on B2B SaaS. And we support both what would be classic term subscription businesses. So sales, primarily sales-led models, or to your point, product-led growth. We support usage-based uh, invoicing billing as well. Um, we have about 2,200 customers, so we have a large N. Uh, we take that data anonymously, roll it up, and are looking at different dimensions in terms of growth primarily was the first version of this report. So what's happened across that customer base? We work with companies that are early stage, even pre-revenue. They're trying to put a billing system in place up to we have about 50 public companies that use us within divisions. We have about 100, 100, 200 companies that are greater than 100 million. So a really wide range. The common denominators are all B2B SaaS. And the, I'd say the other common denominator is most of them are backed by uh, VC or PE. Mm-hmm. So we offer billing and invoicing, rev rec, and reporting. And that reporting in terms of what's going on gross retention and net retention and LTV to CAC and magic number, all those things that you want to be able to manage your business better, but then manage your investors. Uh, if you're going to go raise money. So for early stage companies, uh, they're often on QuickBooks and HubSpot or QuickBooks and Salesforce. We sit between those two systems and we act as the system of record for billing and invoicing. So to your point, Jay, uh, we do have an AR module, but we're not dealing with B2C customers where there's a lot of cancellation and 
uh, and uh, chasing. So we, we do dunning and some other pieces, but you know, probably much lighter touch than you. So the report, Maxio Institute Group Growth Report, what we're trying to do is provide a report on a quarterly basis that talks about the year-over-year growth trends. And um, my hope is it's something that B2B SaaS CEOs and CFOs are using to triangulate in terms of what's going on in the market in the private sector. There's a bunch of information out there in terms of public sector companies and what's happening on their growth. Um, There are great surveys out there, Insight Partners, OpenView, um, KeyBank, uh, Ray Reich and Benchmark had just released their report, um, which is really helpful, but it's all survey based. So people are submitting yeah. um, the answers, which yeah, I, I think most people are truthy in terms of the way they submit their answers. Um, but we are the system of record. So for these 2,200 companies in our N for different components are anywhere from about 1,000 to 1,500, depending on how we're parsing it. Um, give you, I think, a really good sense of what's happening broadly. So at the high level, the thing that I would say would pop for me is the average growth rate of all B2B SaaS companies had had a dramatic drop off uh, starting in Q4 2022. It went from about 20% on average to down to Q1 2023, so a year ago, 14%. And it's kind of bumped around there in Q2 of 23, it was 16%. Q3 was 16% and Q4 was 15%. And so the question we were all asking ourselves is, you know, when is this B2B tech recession going to turn? And I think there are a whole bunch of reasons why there was pullback on growth. I'm sure you felt it as well in terms of VCs pulling back on their money and telling people they need to extend their runways, et cetera. Um, But we saw a return to growth in Q1 of 2024 at 19%. Uh, So does one data point make a trend? No. But I do think we may be seeing things shifting a little bit, which is good for all of us that are selling into mm-hmm. B2B SaaS. Um, I would say the other interesting thing that we do is we do um, split out by size. So small companies below a million bucks is there's a lot of turn in that and churn in companies, whether they can get funded or not. And we saw really anemic growth in that segment um, since uh, really it took a precipitous dive in, in Q3 of 2022, where companies that were less than a million bucks were growing negative 6.7%. Uh, so fast forward, Whoa. whatever that is, eight quarters. And in Q1 of 2024, those companies less than a million bucks, average growth rate was 25%. So a bunch of companies went out of business, right? A bunch of new companies are getting started, but still to hit a million bucks is probably a couple years of, of work, right? Unless you're just totally on fire. So there are things to explore there that we will over time are, are most of these companies that are riding the wave of AI or cyber. We've seen, uh, uh, we break out by verticals as well. So to that point, if I can just p- pull my uh, report up, um, and we'll be happy to provide copies of this to people in the show notes um, later. But uh, let's see. So if you look by vertical, for example, whoops, where is it? Um, yeah, that was the one thing that stuck out to me is that table yeah. with the vertical growth rates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So cyber has had really strong growth um, over the last couple of quarters. Actually, it was down to 17% in Q1 2024, and that was down from 33% in Q4 and 40% in Q3. So cyber had been growing like crazy, a little bit of the tail off, where you're seeing a lot of growth. Uh, the largest vertical is developer and engineering tech. And so that may be, that's 40% year over year growth. That may be tied in with people investing in their engineer, um, uh, trying to get scale, right? And the technology that they're using. I know um, we've imported some tools for our DevOps, for example. Um, But the the verticals are just getting crushed. Media tech, and that's been Mm. consistent. Media marketing tech has just really had a a rough go of it, um, which sort of near and dear since I spent 20 years in marketing tech to see that and how hard it is. There's so many competitors in that space. And a lot of that technology, I I think we're just getting more clear in terms of must have versus nice to have. Um, And so a lot of the marketing tech, I think, sort of falls below the line. Um, One comment, not in the report, but one of the things I have heard is that uh, PE firms and investors are getting tighter in terms of what percent of your revenue are you spending on internal software? And what I've heard is best yeah. practices two to four percent. 
And so we actually went through an exercise at Maxio. We had hundreds of, you know, different software that we were using because you have this world where anyone can buy the software on their credit card. And um, we had to bring it all together and say, wait, you know, this is how much we're spending. We have to reduce that. And so it was like whack-a-mole and cutting out software, renegotiating software, refusing buying new software. And we've, we've gotten our down to about two and a half percent of revenue, uh, which is pretty darn good. Um, my, uh, the people who back us battery, uh, started this down this path when they said, Randy, every company we meet says that Maxio is a customer and that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> it's that it wasn't that they were yeah. customers of Maxio is that we were customers of them. And, uh, you know, I think <laughs> in the heady days, the yeah, we, 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 we loved every single B2B tech company that was out there. Uh, and in the heady days, I think that was, you know, people were buying tech and using it and deploying yeah. it across different silos. So I do think we may, part of the return to growth, maybe a lot of people who've done the belt tightening have now coming back into the market and being more deliberate and intentional uh, in the purchases they're making. Yeah. It, it, the, sorry, Barrett, I think you're going to try to get a word in there. Go ahead. No, I was just going to chime in. I think that seems really interesting. And it's pretty, um, it, it relates, obviously, we're in a different world, more in the B2C and prosumer space with who we serve, but it definitely seems like the space is getting way more competitive and that last year we saw really high levels of cancellation. We did a, also did a um, 20, 2023 um, state of retention report for our cohorts. And uh, we saw similar things where the cancellation rates were really high. And then now they're starting to dip back and growth is coming back a little bit. And it seems to me that, you know, there was just a, there is just a huge increase in new entrants in the market and yeah. high competition. And yeah, hard to put your finger on exactly what that is and what that means, but it, it definitely at least feels like that's happening. There is a guy who did uh, a, a top spin to the article um, that Ray Reich published, this bench market survey, which I would encourage everyone to look at it. Yep. It's really sophisticated. It's split by, I like what he does is he splits his uh, data analysis by size of company and by size of contract. So what size ACV do you have and what's the average CAC, new CAC blended, expansion CAC and all those details. And then also by size of company. So I think it really helps. You can triangulate on that. And there's some guy, um, shoot, I could find it in a second, but he wrote this great report. And basically uh, he showed over the last 10 years, the growth of funding, the number of startups. And so to your point, Bear, there's just this concentration. If demand is going down and you have more competitors, then the uh, cost per acquisition has gone up. And it's just making it harder. And we've seen uh, that as well in his report about the cost for expansion CAC. So going into your current customers, trying to sell more. That's what everyone did about a year and a half ago was, well, if I can't get new logos, it's so expensive. Well, I'm going to focus all my energy and effort and to drive module adoption and penetration in the customer base. But it's just everyone is, is kind of holding on the line in terms of uh, spending more. Yeah. And then... There's also a price increase thing that's happening as well yeah. when you when you talk about expansion. Do you are you all able to see that in your data as well? We no, um, we haven't been able to publish that yet. We could. It's an interesting question because we do have price catalog data that we capture. I don't know. It's a good question. I can take a look at that. I will say what I've seen uh, written by other folks is at least the public companies. A lot of the way they're driving their growth is through price increase, and it's on average like seven to nine percent. And so that has right. been, yeah, seven to nine percent um, per year CPI, right? And I, I know I felt that with Salesforce. They came in and said, "Here's your new price," and I was like, "Wait, what do you mean? This is a recession. You need to give me a price discount." And they're like, "No, we got you." Um, so you know, at some point, I'm going to get my skin back from them. But um, it did make us think about pricing, and we looked broadly across our customers, and there's a whole set of customers where we haven't increased price in years, and it just wasn't yeah. a lever that we pulled. Um, it is one of the levers pricing and packaging. I think that people are going to get, it's the first, like first thing you do is you increase price. Second thing you do is cut people, right? Like if you're going to try to be efficient growth and then you got to do the hard work after that. And so I do think a lot of people followed the path, Salesforce is the world, the Marketos, et cetera, did in terms of, uh, increasing price broadly in the market. It feels like the, the SaaS world is, is finally hit this inflection point and maybe this is just temporary maybe not 
But it feels like it's finally hit this inflection point where everybody is expecting a SaaS company now to be a real business, just like every other real yeah. business on the planet. Do you feel yeah. that? I do. I, gosh, I, let me see if I can find this. We can and let me, let me just for people out, who are listening to this, let me clarify what I mean by real business. That means at some point, like you have a viable, clear path to sustaining your own company on your customer revenue, not outside fundraising, assuming that the company is going to double in valuation in 24 months, right? Yeah. There's not necessarily as clear of a path to raising money. Um, so you have, you almost have to run it like a, like an actual business, right? Where it supports and sustains itself. A hundred percent. And then I think that is, you know, it's a real business, right? It's not just the promise. We see that in terms of, um, you see that in terms of how people are valuing companies. So they're not valuing it just on top line revenue anymore. They're right. valuing it on EBITDA. And can you drive to, at one point we were talking about, um, the rule of, uh, the rule of 40 and moving from growth at all costs to efficient growth. And, and, you know, the benchmark report, which I just, I, I gave you the link to the guy, Mark Haney, I think it's Haney at, um, uh, Harney, excuse me, at Cloud Ratings did a really great tear Oh down. yeah, I saw that. I know what you're uh, talking about. Yeah. Really good. I didn't just, go deep in it. Right. But he talks about the cumulative SaaS funding to your point, Baird. He talks about what the funding history has been recently. And so there's a lot of pullback on that. The, ex the increase in expansion, CAC and percent of you know, just really nice job from 2009 to 2023. And so I just think that snapshot really helps co contextualize the broader, what, what happened in 2023. But I, your broader point about your companies having to grow up and have a viable business model, uh, I think especially if you start to get north of 20 million bucks, right? Zero to one, you're just doing product market fit. One to 10, you're trying to do a bit of scale. You build a replicable sales model. But then after 10 mil, 10 to 30, 10 to 40, you have to show that you can keep and grow customers. And then I think when you get in that next zone, which, you know, where we are in Maxio, it's, uh, it's a business model thing. So now you start to come into pricing, right? Like, how do you think about different pricing across different products? How do you think about regions? How do you think about partners? And, and you got to be showing a pathway to profitability if you aren't profitable. Um, there's a great article by a guy named Todd Gardner, who I'd like immensely. I don't know if you follow yeah. him. He's yeah. total hoot, wicked smart, one of the founders of SAS Capital originally. Now he's doing his own gig. And, you know, caveat, he does do some writing for us. So I talk with him regularly. And he had this article called uh, The Dolphin Principle. And The Dolphin Principle was, can you get your company to go public, uh, profitable? Can you actually get it to a point of being profitable? Because then you control your own fate and you can be decisive about uh, in future investments. And so you don't have to remain profitable if you've got a, a, a new region, a new segment that you're going after, or you're launching a new product. But it's you're out in front and controlling your fate. And, and so mm -hmm. when I came to Maxio, that was one of the things I was doing. I hadn't had that metaphor, but I'd love it to get profitable every once in a while and then be deliberate about the next set of investments, which is what mature companies do, right? They think about ROI, present value versus the trade off of long term investment, capital efficiency, using things like NPV and ROI. Um, and uh, he has a great, great article on that. Definitely have to check that one out. Dolphin principle. I like that. Yeah. You can go yeah, yeah. in and out of profitability. Totally. Yeah. 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 Um, so from a, pr the pricing conversation is an interesting one. We, we've just been um, re revamping our pricing a little bit just to try to structure it differently. And um, we, we ended up going with something which is, I guess you'd think of as like a two part tariff where you have sort of a base platform fee and then yep. some kind of usage on top. And the Correct. reason we, yep. we did that is because, um, you know, our, we didn't want to go to a pure percentage based model. Like we save our customers money. We save our customers revenue. Actually, we didn't want to charge by percentage there. It's just operationally tough for us and customers, you know, CFOs don't like a variable bill from a vendor. They actually right. like a, the steady bill from a vendor. So right. we try to come up with a model that met somewhere in the middle. We're not convinced we have it totally right yet, but um, just curious. He, he, the report talks a lot about um, invoice or mm -hmm. sort of, sort of the, the consumption based model versus the yeah. subscription based model. Yep. So um, in, in what you found, I think if I'm, if I assimilated it appropriately is that 
the growth in the consumption space is actually up. Whereas it was down a couple of years ago yeah. when people were starting to cut back and tighten their belts and you know everybody was looking at their cloud spend and AWS and Google and Azure and all these things. So I'm just yeah, curious. The, the yeah. thing I would, I would say is it, it's not completely uh, synonymous, but in general, sales-led motions tend to be annual subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Right, so you got to negotiate it. You got to get the procurement, and they're often, uh, you know, annual terms. Uh, the PLG motion is often a usage-based month-to-month. So when you look at the consumption trend that you you're pointing to, I think they were hit earlier with the re retraction, and people just stopped paying, right? Because it's month-to-month. -month. Whereas you right. see a step down with the subscription billing model. You know, each year there's a set of customers that either contract or, or churn. I think what we would argue, and when I started this company two years ago, it felt like there was um, this ex existential debate about are you uh, PLG or SLG? And I was like, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm both, right? Like, I think the, the answer when you look at the data is you need to be both. Is the companies that have a platform fee is a, is a great point j is is you're covering your cost to develop the platform you're delivering a set of value and then you dial in this usage component or consumption based component which has a more direct perhaps uh, if you can a direct uh, association with the value that's being delivered by the customer so if they you know sell more widgets um uh they see that the value you're offering uh is totally in line with that um but it does introduce volatility to your point, um, in terms of your own trying to figure out uh, managing your own ARR, and most VC firms will say usage is ARR, but you're kind of like, ah, I don't know, it's kind of a gray area. And how do you forecast your your usage ARR? Do you use one month times twelve, the last trailing three months times four? So if you're going down the path of introducing usage based pricing, metering, pricing, invoicing, uh, it is, it's more complicated. And, that, and that's what I would say is where Maxio can help because that's something that we do well. There are a lot of invoicing engines out there that will allow you to do the standard you know, year contracts. And then you're just worried about the rev rec and reporting if you're doing that right in accrual, accrual accounting. But I do think the world is moving in the direction of can you associate your pricing and packaging in a, more directly with the value that you're delivering? Mm -hmm. My whole world prior to this has been, well, not 100% true, but mostly was seat-based. Like at Salesforce, you would sign up for a number of sellers that were on your platform and then, you know, number of modules that they bought. And um, so then it was, a, it was a conversation around, well, how much am I willing to pay for a seat on Salesforce versus a seat for Gong or a seat for all my other sales tech stack? And you were working with, a, I'm willing to spend this much money for technology for my salespeople. Um, totally shift because we actually do pricing based on trailing 12 months of revenue. And the assumption is that the value you're getting increases over time in terms of the rev rec reporting, the complexity that manifests inefficiency and effectiveness for you and your finance team and et cetera. It's tough. Um, I think we're fortunate that the early billing vendors all had that as their model mm -hmm. percent of billing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we do get customers who don't like the volatility. And so we do have some tier, we do tier based pricing. Like if you hit this tier and then you pop up to the next tier yeah. and we're actually working <clears> through <throat> um, pricing right now, doing a presentation next week, the board. To my earlier point, I think pricing, getting sophisticated about pricing is one of the management capabilities that all B2B SaaS companies need to be developing. Randy, so there's a lot of parallels here with us. <clears throat> In our world, we have, um, you know, our customers can be very different, like you said, if they're doing feature-based pricing based on usage pricing or seat-based pricing, they generally fit very different playbooks on our side, uh, which we've been learning to kind of, you know, have some different cohorts that we treat differently. And I, I'm curious, how, how, does, how do you all manage? Well, first off, my assumption is consumption versus subscription-based models. They feel, are, are they very different types of customers for you all? And if so, how do you all kind of, you know, serve both, but under one platform and one kind of you know unified message. Well, that is the challenge, Baird. I, you, you put the finger on the thing that I've been struggling with is when we think about the billing engine supporting PLG, that's usually early stage companies. So founders, they got a product, they want to go get paid, they do an PLG motion, everyone loves PLG. 
um, once you start to move up market, and then they're selling to consumers or SMBs, once you start to move up market, mid market, early stage enterprise, you're going to need sales, a sales assist motion. And that's where you introduce your sales led growth. So when you look at our customer profile, our 2200 customers, it pretty much plays out that way that our larger customers tend to be what would have been our legacy SaaS optics solution. It's RevRack and reporting. The other kicker for us um, is early stage companies usually don't have a finance team. They're using a CPA firm or their uncles or bookkeeper or something like that. They're not taking private, they're not taking professional money yet, you know, friends and family. Once you bring on, uh, you get to a certain size and you bring on either like a fractional CFO or you hire your first controller and you take private money, there's a new level of accountability that you have to, and you move from cash to accrual accounting. Accrual, there's a new level yeah. of accountability that you need to be able to do in terms of RevRec and reporting. And so it becomes more of a mandate to have a system like ours in that place. But what you're pointing to, my big challenge, is our value prop for early stage founders who tend to be technology savvy, who would most likely just go to Stripe, is how do we sell against that? Because Stripe, you can get up in 10 minutes. It's a PLG motion. We don't have that yet. We're working on it, but we don't have that yet. Um, and then the other persona, it's the same ICP, right? It's B2B SaaS private equity, uh, VC, PE backed, it's, you know, high growth type companies. The other persona though, is this, this head of finance. And so the story you're telling them is really different. And so it, it has been a challenge in terms of how to think about messaging. Um, one of the things we've done, which I introduced when I got here was segmentation. So how do you segment uh, the people you're going after the prospects, uh, then have a sales motion that's supporting a segmentation. And then actually that rolls all the way through your customer success. So the early stage um, startup companies we're going after, our expectation is the price point is going to be a lot lower. The sales cycle should be less than 30 days. They should be able to get up and run with really low touch. And we're not going to have a whole lot of CSM engagement. The larger customers that we sell, I don't know, $150,000, like that's going to be a 90 day sales cycle, and it's going to require a, a digital sales room, and you're going to have multiple people on the buying committee. I'm going to be involved. It's going to take uh, implementation specialists and you know two sales engineers to get them up and running. It's going to take four months. And so we we have tried to segment our go to market plays to uh, make that more clear. Where the rub is is if you go to our website you go to our website it says billing and financial operations it's kind of like if you're a founder and you're looking at that you're like well i don't know what financial operations is because i've never done it before um so obviously if people are searching on keywords uh, uh or organic search it will resolve into the specific solutions we offer so i think we'd have a good job of that but just on the front door it feels to me like we still got a little complexity that we're trying to work through that makes sense. Yeah, I like the concept of having customers grow into different parts of your platform over time. Because even right. when just looking at Maxio, we're going through our pricing, and I'm like, oh yeah, we're we might be, you know, we're now at a stage where we're implementing a little bit of a com consumption based, performance based element to our pricing. Right. And uh, for you know, just looking at it, it's like, oh yeah, we might need something to help support that. Um, well, that as, we'll be happy to do that sale. Yeah. Um, what what I would say is that <laughs> bringing those two platforms together. So, what are the go forward idea is we have one billing engine where you can yeah. do both term based and uh, consumption, but it's one billing engine, and then we have one reporting platform. So, when you're looking broadly across, hey, what's happening across all my different customers, and they could have different. Uh, uh, skews and it, like <clears throat> you think it, we can bill it is basically the idea. And then you can aggregate it. So I'm sorry, I'm taking a far left turn here, but just out of my own interest. Um, so the Chargeify SAS Optics merger, that was April 2022. So we've been. No, the original um, uh, acquisition was 2021. 21. I joined in 2022. And gotcha. So, okay. Uh, so it was a, basically a simultaneous close, which, uh, you know, and, 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 and an MOE, a merger of equals, which I've talked with some folks about, like really hard versus an acquisition where you have a larger entity that brings a smaller entity in mm. and says, this is how we do it at company X. You need to come play by our rules. Mm -hmm. When you have two companies about the same size, literally about the same size in terms of people, dollars and customers, it was, you know, the, the bloods versus the crips on every decision <laughs> in terms of which was going to win. <clears throat>
Yeah. And sorry to maybe open up a big, um, uh, open a big jar towards the end of the podcast, but yeah, what was that experience like? And I guess the maybe one question is how long did it take for the proverbial dust to settle? Is it, or is the dust still settling? How does, where are you all in the life cycle of a merger like this? Of yeah. So I came in a year after it started and I would say they hadn't done a lot on the integration before I showed up. Now there'll be people who will say that's not true. Uh, they did agree on a brand. So Maxio became a brand. Uh, mm-hmm. We launched that basically simultaneously when I showed up. And then it was, hey, SAS Optics uh, by Maxio was the initial start. And then Maxio, former SAS Optics. And so there was a journey there. I would say it took longer than it probably should have. I had to hire a new head of engineering when I started. It took a little while for that guy to ramp and get his head around it. But I mean, we were in the worst of possible worlds. The engineering team for um, Chargefy, Wicked Smart, all in, 98% was in Poland. The platform was based on Ruby. SAS Optics, 98% of the engineers were US based in the Southeast in Atlanta, and it was all on Python. And we even had something else that was Java, uh, another company that had been bought. So we had three different language based platforms. And so do you go Java? Do you go Ruby? What do you do? And you know the engineers mm. don't even speak the same language. So there was just a lot of that, which wow. um, was hard. Uh, when I came on board, I started an initiative called, you know, One Maxio, and it was across everything. How are we going to take down one brand? So the first thing we did is we launched an integrated website, right? Next thing we did was we integrated the sales team in one sales motion. Next thing we did was, you know, all marketing. Next thing we did was um, uh, all systems back. Like we had two different Jira systems, we had two different Salesforce systems. So getting all of that back end infrastructure mm-hmm. probably took longer than we wanted to. Where are we on the journey? Everything is One Maxio except for there are a couple of components in terms of the platform where we're moving to a microservice architecture. We're using the services that used to be uh, Chargeify, and now we need you know, simultaneous data sync across both. And so that's we're going to get over that hump uh, this summer, and then it truly will be an integrated platform. Um, the UI UX has gotten a lot more integrated. I would say if you look at it still, there's probably a couple things where you're like, ah, that seems like it's a little wonky. But uh, we, we have a new design system that we've been working against for a year. So we're probably a year behind what Battery wanted um, in terms of integration. I have never seen something as hard as this. Uh, yeah. Again, going back to the two companies coming in with, you know, same size sumo wrestlers. Um, I'd say that advantage I've had is I came in as Maxio first. So I don't have any allegiance to either. I just want the best answer. So, and now I've also unfortunately had a cycle on the executive team. I don't know, 50% of the executive team is new. So they're coming in with the perspective of like, how do we scale B2B SaaS companies to $100 million? What are the systems, processes, and tools? How do we make decisions in terms of what's best for Maxio? So I think the blood crypt thing has died down a little bit. Um, I think if you take people out for a beer that, and they used to be SaaS optics or used to be Chargeify. They'll still tell you it was better when it was, you know, back then. But uh, we just, I'd say the other big challenge, and I've talked about some of this with some folks, which was an aha for me, was both companies call them $12, $15 million. And then all of a sudden you bring two companies together and now you're $30, $40 million. You, you kind of went from childhood to going off to college without mm. the awkward teenage years. <laughs> no one had seen that movie before. And so you are a different company when you are yeah. 15 million and 20 million and 30 million and 40 million. What you expect, to, what you need in terms of infrastructure, how you think about strategy, how do you think about investment? It's just really different. And so that was something that was uh, wild for me was I was like, oh, I'm coming in at a company of this size. We're going to have, I assume, X, Y, and Z. And then as you start poking around, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's still being done as a two companies that are 12 to $15 million. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Greg. Tough, tough, interesting problems to solve. But in my experience with M&A and integrations, it's almost like the size does not matter. It's as complex to integrate a $10 million and a $2 million company as it is to integrate two $20 million companies. Now you had it probably more complex and the tech stacks were not aligned and that kind of thing. But it's almost like with M&A, bigger is better because you're going to incur the same kind of pain and the same kind of slowdowns either way. I, I think you're right. Unless you're doing like an aqua hire, 
where you're bringing mm-hmm. in a talent that's going to say you're not going to continue on with their technology, but you want their brains and you're going to put them against your your platform to build that next new capability. I think right. that's probably true. I think, um, yeah, when I, when I, I mean, there's different types of M&A. We can talk all about it. But I, I will tell you one of the ones that I hope never to do was it's seismic. They took out a competitor. And the idea was to migrate all of the competitors' customers over to the seismic platform. But up until the point that the acquisition happened, I mean, they hated each other. It was oh, like, yeah. you know, seismic had a bullseye of the CEO of the other company and in the sales room and people were throwing darts <laughs> at it, right? And Doug showed up. That Doug Winter is the CEO. He tells the story. He showed up this company. I think it was in Chicago, and uh, it was like the Antichrist had arrived. Um, yes. But you know, they took out a competitor, and they were able to migrate uh, customers over time. And so that that has its own challenges for how to manage and do that well. But I think uh, Jay, my experience at M and A, and I've done it. I've been on the integration teams, and then I led M and A corporate strategy at Seismic for a couple of years, and now I'm doing another integration. I do think everyone gets all fired up about the deal. And unless you have someone that's almost OC, like, you know, they're totally focused on details for the integration plan, then 80% of M&A fails. And it fails, Mm -hmm. they say, primarily because of culture. But I also think it fails because there hasn't been detailed planning around integration and accountability to to shut things down. Or just things just keep, you know, keep going because it's just easier than, than making the hard call. So... Well, you that's hundred percent yeah. true. Hundred percent true. I and I've seen it. You know where you avoid making the hard call because, like, you really need to like the call you made at Seismic to close down one product. That's a call that I would say ninety percent of people don't make because it is hard, and you're afraid you're going to lose the people that you just brought on, which you are afraid of because you feel like you yeah. need them to keep the business. And, and it's just, and before you know it, you're two, three, four years down the road, you haven't integrated those those acquisitions and they're like separate businesses sitting under one roof with carrying way too much cost for what they're producing for the business. I've yeah. seen it over and over again. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's funny because it, it is super cool to think about it. Um, and, and look, I'm a part of a PE company. The assumption is they're going to do more mm-hmm. M&A. You, and, right. and what PE, right. if you sell to another PE is what they want to see is that you've built that muscle. And so how do you go find the next M&A deal that is manageable so it's not the pig going through the python but it's 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 not going to distract the team but you're able to show how it augments because no so i mean i'm making a statement someone's going to tell me i'm totally wrong but most software companies when you get to this stage between that 1500 million bucks your growth is going to come from organic plus inorganic so as a ceo and executive team you got to be able to do this well and the partner not partner but the uh board member my chairman at at uh Maxio is super successful PE back CEO guy multiple times. Like he ran a company that did like 20 M&A transactions over three mm-hmm. years or something. And it's just what they did and, and, and created, you know, created an enormous amount of value, drove EBITDA, which consolidated. And so I think it's like anything, if, if you, if you, you focus on it and, and, and practice, you can get better, but it can't just be some random idea. Cause you thought it would be cool to add this capability and like whoop, buy them and go, which I think, happens sometimes yeah it's like a different business model it is a business model of its own and Mm -hmm. i I would venture to say that a lot of our listeners are on the earlier stage of developing and building companies and they have Mm -hmm. the product innovation ideas and Mm -hmm. they're probably thinking wow like this is what i have to look forward to like well maybe you know yeah we call it that's part Mm -hmm. of our positioning is around the scale up challenge and so when you're one product one channel you have a set of challenges you're facing with then when you introduce multiple products there's another set of challenges that multiple products multiple challenges and then if multiple products multiple channels multiple products multiple channels multiple regions each one of those is kind of those inflection points and i think you'll see it they call it death valley right you have these valleys of death between when you hit 10 million, can you get what you need to get sorted out to get to the 20 million valley of death? And I think there's a valley of death at yeah. 1 million. Like once you get past 1 million, you, and this is where for you all as the executives, it's what are, you, what are you doing today to get you ready for the next 12 to 18 months? And as you get mm-hmm. bigger, your altitude has to go higher. You're, like I tell my team, if we're making decisions about what needs to be done today or in the next month, we're over-functioning. And we're disempowering our management chain. Like we as the ELT, 
we get paid to think about the bets we need to make that are going to manifest over the next 18 to 24 months. It's super hard. You know, all that important, not urgent. Much easier to take on the urgent thing and feel like you're mm-hmm. making a lot of traction and yeah. your activity filled day. But are you making the hard decisions that are going to change your business? And I think that's true up to about 100 mil. And I've talked to a couple of folks who've done that transition past 100 million. And they say, look, at 100 million, you now have things that are ossified and that you're not going to be able to change. It's too hard to change. Yeah. So that, that, that zone between 40 as you're setting up into 100, like trying to get it right in anticipation of what it means to be at scale at 100 million bucks. Uh, because if you're going to go sell to a strategic, or you're going to sell to a PE firm at that size, they'll want to see a bunch of that stuff is in place because they know that you, you know, know how to operate at scale. Well, and, and they're not going to invest in changing it either, right? right. If you have systems issues, because they're only going to hold a company for what, three, five, yeah. maybe seven years if it's like the cycle we're in now. Yeah. So, yeah. And then so, there's yeah, investments just, at that point. I think people, like when I started um, in software, it was, well, I was fortunate, right? Like my first CEO, CEO gig was of a public company. I got a battlefield promotion to a public company. Now, I didn't enjoy the fruits of taking a company public, but I, I enjoyed all the, <laughs> all the challenges of being a public company CEO. But I always thought, well, yeah, now I want to take a company, I want to take a company public. Like, I want to check that box. But the reality is 80, 85% of all uh, software exits, if you, if you get to an exit, a good exit, is going to be selling to someone else. It's going to be a PE firm or another strategic. And I think yeah. um, understanding that, that what are you building a company for? You're trying to deliver value, obviously, for customers and value for shareholders. But when a PE firm especially comes in, your implied point, Jay, they're looking to say, okay, I got in at this amount. In three to five years, I need someone else to believe in this ham and the team's ability to execute, and they're going to pay this much more. And there's right. like the knock-on effect, right? You just keep going up the the stack on the PEs, and then all of a sudden you're talking to you know the big Vista funds and the Tomo Bravas of the world. and you know, all right, now we're talking about a, a billion dollar transaction. You're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Or, you know, in, in some lucky cases, you find the right strategic buyer, which is somebody right. that your product fits into their portfolio in a very special way. And it's, you know, uh, it's more valuable to them than it is just to the next private equity firm who's going to recap. And it. I was, I was fortunate. I, you know, I had those two experiences. One was Rocket Fuel. We ended up selling it to PE with the public company uh, in part because we were like burning cash like crazy. And there was a, there was a business model problem that we were trying to sort out. And it's very hard to do a, a pivot or transformation in the public market. So it was yeah. right to go private. And yeah. I, didn't, I didn't stay with them. Uh, but the second company, Percolate, I sold to a strategic, Seismic. And to your point, it was because the CEO and I had a real common vision for how to think about content and creating content, distributing content across marketing and sales and how you can improve go to market. And so those patterns that we had at Percolate still are manifest in Seismic. And so a lot of employees are still there. Customers are still there. Um, but it is really rewarding to have a strategic safe harbor, which brings you across because they value what you're doing and you have a shared vision uh, versus what might happen with a, with a PE firm is you got a platform that says, no, I'm going to stick you here. And this is what yeah. you're going to go. You know. Did that Was that strategic? Um acquisition that you mentioned was that did that just happen organically because of the relationship or was that was it an approach first that then was a fit yeah you, you know Bear, that's a great question um one of the things i've heard over my years as ceo is that the best companies uh don't sell themselves they get bought mm-hmm. meaning that there's a strategic out there that has a vision for what they want to do and accomplish and they get to know you you know you date then you get engaged and you get married Um, I would say for Percolate specifically, um, it was a kind of a mixed bag. Uh, Doug and I had gotten to know each other, introduced by a mutual investor, um, and we're starting to build that relationship and talking about the future and how things could work together, working on just trying to do deals together. Um, Then we started at Percolate to go into a process, and and that's when it was like, okay, now, you know, how, how... how sexy do you think I am, Doug? Like, can we make this thing work? Um, but I Great don't questions. think it would have worked if we hadn't had strategic alignment from the mm-hmm. beginning. So I know, like, we're trying to buy companies. I've gone at, at Percolate. I've, there's a bunch of deals that we've tried to do, and we just haven't been able to get alignment in terms of what battery is willing to pay versus what they want to sell for. But the ones that have 
um, I've been talking to for the entire two years I've been here, a lot of it has been about the relationship I'm building with that CEO and painting a picture of where we see the world going in the office of the CFO and how could we add you all to this picture that would create an, another module and, and provide more value. And so I think um, there are the one, the deal that we will do we will be one that will have come from those relationships versus I got bankers calling me every day saying, hey, take a look at this, take a look at this, take a look at that. And they're often distressed assets. I don't know anything about them. They want me to right. do an LOI in 30 days. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't have time and energy to do that. So I, I think the best deals are the ones where you have that long courting going mm -hmm. on. Um, I mean, I tried to sell Percolate to the other thing I just make, mentioned. I tried to sell Percolate to Adobe and was you know, trying to figure out who was the right people to get to know and blah, blah, blah. They ended up buying a company called Workfront, which was kind of similar to what we were doing. It killed me because it was like we were better in some ways. And I, the Workfront CEO was brilliant. Don't get me wrong. He did a great job. But he had courted the relationship better than I had. And they also were bigger. One of the things about selling yeah. to P, uh, public companies, at least this was a couple of years ago, you needed to be at least $100 million and you needed to be EBITDA positive because you couldn't be dilutive to their earnings. And you needed to be meaningful in terms of what they, you know, they say they buy this company, how is it going to actually help in terms of revenue or generating new customers? And we were just subscale. So I think as a CEO, understanding, we were talking a little bit about this a little earlier, what is the set of strategics where you would add value? If you're a $1 million comp dollar company, unless you're doing an aqua hire, you're probably looking to sell to companies that are 20 to 30 million bucks. At 50 million, now we're looking to sell to companies that are $200 million, right? But I'm probably not going to sell to a, a multi-billionaire, billion dollar company as a $50 million uh, revenue company. At 100 million, now you're talking to public companies. Right. And all the bankers will help you with that. But I do think the, the, pool, the targets you're building relationships with changes based on how big you are. That's a huge insight. I, and, and I think, you know, for, for us and for anybody who's running firm, it, it, these are the companies that you're naturally talking to about partnership of some right, form totally. or fashion anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I think right, right. You, know, you want to figure out joint go to market, and so hey, you 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 guys, you know, we I know we we're talking about a partnership, uh, but yeah, you know, you get to know each other. Do you like each other? Do you have a common value prop? Do you have customers? Do you have a common? Um, I always say, let's go get a case study. If yeah. there are a set of customers who believe, and this is what work front, or excuse me, what Adobe had said to us, we were trying to show how we augmented Adobe and get customers to tell that story. Because if you're at Adobe and you got a bunch of customers saying, "Gosh, we're using you plus Percolate." Why don't you bring Percolate on board? For us, similarly, when we go talk to our partners, we're like, well, what are customers, what are the set of capabilities that you think we should be partnering with? And there's a right. you know, subset, and we go build relationships with them, and we find out we like each other, and we have aligned interests and valuations. Well, then, boom, let's do a deal. And you've already got joint go-to-market. You've got uh, referenceable case studies. You've got you got to know each other across your go-to-market teams. Um, so yeah, I think that's, it is one element of partnership is you're warming, you're warming up, uh, potential M and A targets over time. Gosh, how, how much easier is it to convince your investors that it's the right thing to do if you're already, if you have proof? Totally. Well, the you, thing you, about that, Jay, to spot on. And that was actually one of the challenges in this last deal that didn't go, couldn't get over the finish line was every deal you do needs to have a model with it. And the model is going to be, okay, we're going to yeah. spend this much money. How are you going to cross sell that in what are your assumptions and how much new revenue you're going to be and how's this going to help improve your gross retention if you don't have any experience with that customer excuse me, that partner for customers you don't know it's just a modeling right. exercise and so i think to your point when you have a set of customers or several partners where we have 40 or 50 customers in um in common all right let's go spend time looking at them what happened to them do they value that partnership would they be willing to pay more is there a way to integrate the technology through APIs and, you know, the, absolutely. And I think that is the proof that you need to get an uh, investment case done. Yeah. It's like the minimum viable product for an acquisition. You got it. Right. Never thought and, about it that way before. Yeah, but it makes a lot of sense. It is. It has to be. It was like, where is this going to add value? And I think that, that, that was something I learned when I was at Seismic as you were presenting it. You, you know, you're building this model. You got to go through all the assumptions. You do all your due diligence, right? You do your sales, your service, your tech. But then you got to get down to the business model, and that's a little bit more 
art than science and not change this assumption it works, not change this assumption it doesn't. Because then the next thing they're going to do is the board is going to say, great, go do that deal. And this model now becomes part of your next fiscal year budget. Because you right. said you were going to, you, you said you were going to do this. So, you know, that's right. Like, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. The tech, the ops. I mean, that's the easy stuff. It's the go to market. I, that's, I think so. And delivering on the promise, killer. right? Like, mm-hmm. you, you, yeah, like, uh, again, Doug Winter, who I respect immensely, he was like, Randy, you know, unless you feel like you and your team are banging on the table saying you must do this deal, you're not going to have enough yeah. conviction. To one, get it over the finish line with your investors, but then to get through the hard times. Mm, yeah. Right? Yeah. So it, you should say, unless it's a hard yes, it's a no. And uh, that's been some good... I, I tend to fall in love with lots of different opportunities and yep. like, I yeah. hear him in the back of my head. Is, like, <laughs> is this a hard yes? If not, it's a no. Don't spend any time on it because it can just be yeah. you know, black holes of time and energy to go talk to all these different targets. Totally. Awesome. Well, hey, we're running out of time, but this has been a great conversation. Yeah, I know. I really enjoyed it. Jumping in with us to do it. And uh, awesome, guys. Enjoyed it. Awesome. That's great, man. All right. Let's stay in touch. Good to chat with you. Have a great day. Take care. Cheers. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye.